Good evening, and thank you very much, Paul, for that introduction. The sky this month, unless you have been living under a rock, you are missing out on one of the best things anyone can happen to hope for. Unfortunately, January did not provide a great opportunity because, quite simply, it is in the top five instances of most cloud cover for any month since we've been recording our basically our weather. So here you go. If you are get the opportunity, you do want to go out and have a look at the comet that's in the night sky. C2, uh, 2022 E3 ZTF putting on quite a display. First time apparently in 50,000 years that this comet is doing the loop. And based on this chart, you can see here that the comet is going to be doing a great job. We, here we are, February the 1st, and I would say to you, you really want to, if you get a clear sky, go out with a pair of binoculars. It's relatively easy to find. So you do want to go out there, and it is now past its closest approach to the sun. So it will now start, and closest to the Earth, rather, and it will now start to slowly but surely uh, you know, as it continues its journey, it will ultimately fa fade and finally disappear. And as you can see here, it is going to make a pass right here at Be uh, Beetlejuice. So perfect opportunity if you have a camera, you can get out there. I highly recommend it. One of the most important things about it, of course, is being able to find it. And here is the chart for tonight, Wednesday, February the 1st. 320 universal time from 40 north, 40 degrees north, and roughly where we are four days before full moon. Yeah, great. So here we have a great opportunity to observe and full moon coming up to ruin some of the observing. It seems that that is quite normal for us. So I would say to you, still get out there, pair of binoculars, camera, it's great. One of the other things is, this is where it is in the night sky tonight. So this is right from Stellarium. This was at 1900 hours. So just a bit before we started here, this would have been what you would have seen if you had gone out, if the skies are clear from your location. Now, this is not the only comet, but the other one, which is putting on a great display, we don't get to see. And that is this wonderful beast, Comet P96 Macholtz. Uh, it will get within 0 0.12 astronomical units from the sun on February the 7th. Uh, it is within three degrees of the sun, and it's not visible by us here in the north. But this is from, you know, one of the great shots that you can get if you go online. This is from Space Weather. Perfect. They put it up there for you. And you can see it tracking in from the side here. I will be following this online and virtually, and I hope you will as well. So what is actually going on in the night sky tonight? Well, or in astronomy for us, the days are getting longer. Today, sunrise was 0732, sunset 1720. By the end of the month, sunrise is 0654 and sunset at 1803, which means shortly thereafter we have the proverbial time change and it screws everybody's observing up. If there's one thing I detest is that move to daylight savings time as an astronomer, I would prefer to stay on standard time. But you can see when civil, nautical, and astronomical twilight ends, and so you can plan accordingly if you get clear skies during the month of February. The moon phases, of course, as I said, we're right before full moon, February the 5th. This is known as the snow moon, and this comes from the indigenous cultures as well as colonial and European sources. Basically, the snow moon is known as this because it indicates the heaviest snowfalls of the winter. So most of the snow is going to be out there on February the 13th, of course, last quarter. New moon is going to hit the 20th. 
and we start the new cycle shortly thereafter in February 27th, first quarter. So start to plan your observing accordingly. Now, for the next 14 days, basically, you have a perfect opportunity to go and see zodiacal light. This will happen from February 17th to the 21st. It will be visible in the West after evening twilight. You can get to a fairly dark location. This is what you would normally see. That zodiacal light just streaming up into the night sky from the horizon, basically where the sun has set. So you want to go and have a chance. This is a great opportunity for you. Next couple of weeks, you'll have the opportunity to really observe this. It can be quite unusual for a lot of people. They catch this and they don't know what it is. And so they just begin to question what's going on. But you're not being surprised. Mercury is best for the Southern Hemisphere this month. Uh, from February the 1st, it is a, it's basically 25 degrees away from the sun. And on the 28th, that will shrink to a mere 14 degrees. You will have the opportunity of seeing the crescent moon pass within four degrees south of Mercury on February the 14th. So if you are well... One of those individuals that has never seen Mercury, perfect opportunity for you. Go out, take a shot at it. One of the key things here is Venus is now rising in the evening sky, but there is a good opportunity to watch for a close conjunction with Neptune on February the 15th if the skies are going to be perfect for you. Here's the challenge. It's going to be a 12 magnitude difference between Venus and Neptune in brightness. And they're only 0 0.01 degree apart in the night sky. And there will be a second conjunction with two degrees from the waxing moon, but it'll be best seen in the Western hemisphere. So it's going to be a challenge for us here, but you never know. You might get lucky. I doubt it, though. And this is what you're going to see in the night sky if you go out tonight. If the skies are clear, Venus was right down at the horizon, and Jupiter is just above it. Perfect opportunity to go out, have some observing. Pair of binoculars are great. Perfect time to do some just enjoying what is up there. I will say to you on the 15th, at 18.30 hours, as you can see, I did that for Toronto's location. And you can see where Venus is located as it's now getting closer to Jupiter. The two will get significantly closer. Mars is well-placed for observers in Toronto. It's amongst the stars of Taurus. Uh, it is now starting to move away from us in its orbit. So the two planets are now in their orbits passing each other. The magnitude is going to drop below 0.0. .0. It's actually quite bright and it's easy to see, but you can do a great comparison if you want to figure out how to gauge the brightness of a star. You've got the two red giants and you can also compare their color, Aldebaran and Betelgeuse and Mars in the same relative vicinity in the night sky. This will give you an opportunity to gauge how bright objects are. So it's a perfect time for you if you don't know how to really assess the brightness of an object. Take a look in your star map. How bright is Aldebaran? How bright is Betelgeuse? And compare them to Mars, which is going to stay fairly close to that zero magnitude. It's going to be a bit below that, but that'll help you. And here is how it will look. So you can see here that there is Aldebaran, Mars is above it, and then Betelgeuse down on the side here. So that will help you. Of course, you will also have the moon starting to interfere there, but this is life. You just have to deal with it, unfortunately. 
Uh, Jupiter moves from Pisces into Cetus early in the month, and then it returns. So there's going to be some retrograde there. But what I really recommend is get ready for February the 22nd, because you will have the crescent moon, Jupiter, and Venus in the same part of the sky. And it's going to be a great opportunity for you to be able to take a picture. Cell phone camera, if you have an iPhone, perfect opportunity. This is approximately what you will see. So on the 22nd, 1830 hours, perfect. So just 630 in the evening. If you have a clear sky, go out. And this is the triangle you will see. So you should get that in the field of view. It will be in the west, of course. Saturn, of course, is too close to the sun. So let's just move on. Let's go to the next slide. The planet Uranus is really well placed. You will be able to find it because if you take a look, you can see here at 1930 hours, there's the Pleiades. So you can actually go down and find it, Uranus, with a pair of binoculars. And that would be something that would be worth, if you've never seen it before, in a small telescope or binoculars, perfect opportunity. It's in a part of the sky that it will be easier to find. It will show a disk through a telescope. So that is one of the things that you do want to try. Of course, Neptune is now fading into bright twilight as it heads into its solar conjunction on March the 16th. But it's that close conjunction with Neptune and Venus that you really want to look for. So this is what it's going to look like. So it's going to be a real challenge at that meetup. It's 0 0.01 degrees apart, as I said. And you can see just how faint. There's just this tiniest dot in here that is going to be Neptune in that. But if you are lucky, you can get an opportunity to view two of them close together. The minor planets, you actually will have a chance to see Ceres and Pallas. Both of them are going to appear stationary, even though they are actually in their orbits and moving. It's just the dynamics of our orbital mechanics and how the Earth is placed with, res with respect to the two minor planets. So both of them are here in the star maps, you can see. And that will allow you to find them. If anyone wants, you can just go into Stellarium do a quick search. It will show you where it is easy enough to find. So I would recommend that as an opportunity. It will show up in a telescope, much more challenging in a pair of binoculars. So of the deep sky objects, of course, everyone should take a chance to look at the Pleiades. This is with 10 by 50 binoculars. So this is the approximate view that you would get it looks like this incredible sprinkle of diamonds, especially from a dark sky site. Looking through a well collimated pair of binoculars, 10 by 50s, this is what you would see. And that will show you like tiny jewels. If you have something larger than that, you'll be able to see up to 300 stars. 10 by 50 binoculars, should let you see in this open cluster somewhere on the order of between 50 and 60 stars from this open cluster. So take the opportunity to go out and look at that. And I've picked one more of the clusters that I love to look at in winter, especially since I detest the cold, but I do like to go out with my binoculars. And that is the Beehive, M44. and in a pair of 10 by 50 binoculars, you should be able to resolve up to 20 or so. But here's a great opportunity for you, because in that size of binoculars, you should be able to resolve two double stars. And that is a perfect opportunity. If you are someone that is interested in double stars, here's where you can start. Just needs a pair of binoculars, go out, look, and then you can be uh, working towards your you know, whatever certificate you may be working on, and I recommend this being one of the things that you do, is start looking at double stars. They are really amazing. 
And that's what it will look like through a pair of 50 millimeter binoculars. So that's a decent size for you to see the beehive cluster. Of course, there's also a whole whack of scheduled launches. And this is one that I'm looking forward to may happen by the end of this month. And that will be the maiden flight of the two stage Starship launching from Texas. And if it does in fact launch, the booster will separate 170 seconds into its flight and return to a land approximately 32 kilometers off the shore in the Gulf of Mexico. The second stage will achieve orbit and then of course performed a powered splashdown approximately 100 kilometers off the northwest coast of uh, Hawaii, of Kauai. But they still have some final steps to get and approvals. So I am hoping that this will go. I want to see this rocket launch. And if they will let me know date and time, I'll be there. February is going to be busy for rocket launches. So there's going to be a number of them. And you can see here, SpaceX is, which I hate them for this because more satellite pollution for when you're doing astrophotography but they are going to be launching within a very short period of time. February the 1st, tonight, 0302 a.m. And the window is from 0302 a.m. to 732 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, launching from Canaveral or the Kennedy Space Center. And then there's also on February the 5th, on Sunday, from the uh, Baikonur Cosmodrome, you'll be able to watch the Proton M block DM3. So that is an opportunity there for you. And of course, the Progress supply mission that is supposed to go up to the uh, ISS from Roscosmos. This should be a launch that will also bring back three astronauts because they haven't been able to do it with the Soyuz capsule that is at the ISS because it was punctured by a meteorite. And so there was a coolant leak. This has been a problem. So the three astronauts that were supposed to come back stuck there, and it could be as much as an extra six months before they actually return. And then the Indian Space Research Organization on February the 9th as well, launching. And that will be a micro satellite demo demonstration launch. So that will be something to keep an eye on. We also have the maiden flight of the Mitsubishi Heavy Industries Elos, this particular rocket, and that's supposed to go up February the 12th. Then on the 19th, another Soyuz is launching. So I, I cannot remember which one it will be that will actually bring the astronauts back, but one of those two will. We then have another attempt by the Peregrine Lunar Lander, Kuipersat 1 and 2, and it'll be a maiden flight. That is supposed to launch from Canaveral, but there are no guarantees of the date and time. This could change. ULA is still working on things, but it's estimated to be at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the 24th. And then the Crew-6 from SpaceX is scheduled for February the 26th. That one is now confirmed that it will go, plus or minus, depending on weather conditions. We also have Good Luck, Have Fun. I thought this was great. Uh, it's from Relativity Space. It's due to, to boost off on February the 27th. Again, date and time is to be determined, but this is the estimate, as well as the Firefly Alpha from Fly, Firefly Alpha, uh, uh, Firefly Aerospace, and that's their Flight 3. That's supposed to go from Vandenberg. So we'll see if that one happens. Again, this one is not guaranteed. If you actually go to the website that says, hey, we're going to have lots of launches, it, the February the 28th, has something like 12 or 14 saying that they're flying February the 28th and a lot of them are SpaceX. So they just haven't assigned slots, dates, or times to those. So I've basically left those mostly off. And just to show you, there will be a long march 
going from China on the 27th. That one is still also waiting for date and time, as is the Aditya, which is another one from India. And as you can see here, everything now shows February the 27th, Starlink, Starlink. And on final slide, a new star joined the firmament tonight and made Terry Dickinson basically enjoy his new journey. That, ladies and gentlemen, is my presentation. Any questions? say that uh, the presentation came in loud and clear it's, uh, it's almost as if you were here in person it went off without a hitch thanks again Francois um, let's go to online questions Emma do we have any we didn't get any questions online from YouTube oh wow okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, and in the room do we have any questions for Francois no questions here in the room either today. Okay, very good. Thanks again, Francois. And uh, let's move on to our next speaker. And that is Michael Watson. <coughs> and uh, he'll discuss uh, the uh, topic of recurring central solar eclipses at one location. Go ahead, Michael. All right, everybody. Well, thank you, Paul, very much. Uh, it's nice to be back speaking uh, with the uh, Toronto Centre. Again, I was a member of the Toronto Centre many, many years ago. Um, I think uh, some of you may have seen me before at Toronto Centre uh, meetings. I joined the RESC, believe it or not, in 1970. So I am now in my 53rd year of membership and um, I'm a director of the society and, and first vice president. But I'm not here to talk about that uh, uh, tonight. What I'm here to talk about um, is this. Um, the next uh, 62 weeks are going to be um, really fairly remarkable. Uh, for North American astronomers. And the reason for that is that there are going to be two central solar eclipses visible across North America. We have one coming up in just eight and a half months, so mark your calendars. This is um, a, a, an unusually long annular solar eclipse that will be visible, and I will show you where. You probably already know this, uh, in October. And, and then at the, um, at the next um, uh, eclipse season, uh, which is in April, just a few months after that, uh, we will then have um, the four minute, and this is the, the second so-called great um, American eclipse, four minute total solar eclipse uh, across um, Mexico, the US, and then coming into Canada over uh, Niagara Falls and then across Lake Ontario, just barely missing Toronto, uh, and then going over Kingston and, uh, and further east. So these are two really important eclipses. And as I was thinking about these, as I have been, frankly, for a long time, because I remember that in 1970, when I joined the uh, Astronomical Society, the RESC, people were already talking about the great eclipses of 2017, which, of course, um, uh, many of us will have seen uh, six years ago, uh, and then the even longer total eclipse of 2024, all the way back then, over half a century uh, before they were going to take place. And so I was thinking ab uh, about these uh, eclipses, and I realized that um, their paths were going to cross. And so I thought, uh, you know, I've been interested in this for a long time, and I thought that I would just do a little post up on the ASC list, Rascals, and uh, then when that went up, I was asked to um, the, speak about this. So here I am. And what uh, what I'm going to talk about, there, what I want to, you know, is, is just, first of all, do some acknowledgements, because I've taken uh, this information from a lot of sources. One of the great ones, and one of the great names in mathematical astronomy is uh, Jean Maes, who's a Belgian meteorologist, or retired now, born in 1926, and he has written a series of uh, books in mathematical calculations, and the one that I like, the first one, from 1997, is called Mathematical Astronomy Morsels. And there have been five versions of this come out, and he talks a lot about eclipses and some really, really interesting information about them. So he's the first acknowledgement I want to give. Uh, and then Fred Aspenak, probably the world's um, most renowned and greatest eclipse calculator, who I also um, uh, 
to really call a friend because I got to know him back in 1970. Uh, and he and I observed the uh, 1994 annual for solar eclipse in, uh, in Ohio together. Uh, Fred's a, just a great guy. He worked at, Nauter, at Goddard Space Flight Center for many years before his retirement. Uh, and he runs the, um, uh, the, the website, Mr. Eclipse, which you should uh, go to fantastic uh, uh, photographs, information, everything you need to know about uh, solar and lunar eclipses. And then finally, uh, Xavier Joubier, who is a French astronomer, and he has put together uh, a website in which he, he has uh, on Google Maps, uh, information for all of the eclipses. You can see um, live all of the um, uh, eclipse paths and so on. Zoom in, find the local circumstances for any uh, eclipses in the modern era. Uh, and I use this all the time. And uh, you'll find a, a great deal of information there and very useful maps. So those are the acknowledgements. And so we all know this, and, and I think we probably all learned this when we were, I don't know, about three years old, the geometry of solar eclipses. We know, of course, that, um, and I'm going to simplify this somewhat, but uh, that the moon um, orbits a planet Earth, not in a perfect circle, but rather in an ellipse. And sometimes it's a little further away than usual, in which case it appears smaller in the sky. Sometimes it is closer uh, to Earth. We call it perigee, apogee, further away, perigee, closer to Earth, uh, in which case it is somewhat larger. One of the things I learned when I, I, went, when I was very young is that one of the most, and maybe the most, uh, fantastic and amazing coincidences in nature is that as seen from the surface of planet Earth, the sun is about 400 times as far away as the moon is on average, but also almost exactly 400 times its diameter. And therefore they appear from the surface of our planet to be approximately the same size. And therefore when the moon happens to pass uh, in, in front of the sun, depending on whether it's at apogee or whether it's a perigee, we can see either an annular eclipse if the moon is uh, farther uh, away. So there is still left uncovered. The moon isn't quite large enough to cover the bright photosphere or surface of the sun. And that leaves a thin annulus in Latin, or ring of, uh, of unobscured sunlight still around. If, however, the eclipse occurs, a central eclipse occurs, with the moon passing directly over the sun, and the moon is in that part of its orbit where it is close to perigee, the moon is slightly larger than the sun, and therefore it blocks out the bright surface of the sun completely. And at that time, and at only that time, without special equipment, we can see the sun's corona or atmosphere. And so we can see these uh, here, this is an annual eclipse, and you can see over here, if you can see my cursor, that the shadow, the umbral shadow, moon's far enough away that the umbral shadow, the cone of the shadow, doesn't quite reach the surface of Earth. And so for someone on the surface of Earth, what you actually see then is that thin annulus. Whereas, with a total eclipse, you can see here the moon is closer to uh, planet Earth, and therefore the shadow cone actually reaches Earth, and we can see in this very narrow little path that goes across the planet as moon moves in its orbit, people situated within uh, that area will see the sun completely obscured. People located to the north or to the south because of parallax will see the moon shifted to the north or south of the sun and it will miss the center of the sun and we will not get and you will not be able to see a total eclipse. You'll see a partial eclipse from uh, those locations. That's the basic geometry of a, a solar eclipse. And by the way, it is a misnomer. It's not an eclipse at all. They're actually occultations. Eclipses are when something falls into the shadow cast by some, something else. And so, for example, lunar eclipse is properly called that. They're actually solar occultations. They both disappear, but that's the, the geometry is somewhat different. Okay, so let's talk about the frequency of these. How often do they happen? Well, you know, we hear all the time in the news media that eclipses are rare. This is rare. Everything is rare. Well, not actually so much in this way. Um, so Fred Espinac did a study uh, of 5,000 years of solar uh, eclipses. And as it uh, indicates here, his study showed uh, that there are almost, there are almost 12,000 eclipses during that period of time. And we can see that most frequently of all of those eclipses are the partial eclipses. Partial as seen from some place on Earth's surface, accounting for about 35% of all of the solar eclipses. Annular eclipses, as we can see, account for almost exactly one third. Somewhat less frequent are total eclipses. Uh, 
I'm going to get back to that in just a moment. Uh, just a little over one quarter of all eclipses are total. And then a very, very small <clears throat> proportion are hybrid eclipses. I'm not going to talk about that too much. What that means is that at the ends, the start and the end of the shadow as it crosses planet Earth, it's an annular eclipse. In the middle, it's a total eclipse, a very brief uh, total uh, eclipse. Um, and the reason why annular eclipses are more frequent than total eclipses is that on average in its elliptical orbit around Earth, the moon is just a little too far away to be able to cover the sun in its entirety. And what it indicates then, for, therefore, is that about 60% of the time, the moon's too small. It's only at that portion, only about 40% of its orbit where it's close enough so that if it passes in front of the sun, it's large enough to cover the sun completely. So total eclipses of the sun are less frequent than, an, uh, than annular eclipses of the sun. And what we see here, sorry, let me just go back. We see then that someplace on Earth's surface, there is a total eclipse of the sun visible every approximately 1.6 years. So approximately two total eclipses every three years, someplace on Earth's surface. For annular eclipses, they're more frequent, one and a quarter years. We see partial eclipses even more frequently than that, just a little over one year on average. Hybrid eclipses, you gotta wait a long time to see anywhere on Earth's surface. And so there is a solar eclipse of some kind visible on average from someplace on Earth's surface every 153 days or more more than twice a year. There have to be two solar eclipses in every calendar year. There can be rarely up to five. Now, um, it, it's sort of, you know, we, we, we wonder, well, it, it should be the same in both uh, hemispheres, isn't that right? Well, the answer is actually no. The relative frequency of annular and total eclipses is not actually the same in the northern and southern hemisphere, and I'll tell you why. So there's the answer, several answers, and they're all no. And the reason for that is that um, if we consider northern hemisphere summer, which is in at the uh, starting at the end of June. At that time, the Earth's axis is tilted, so that the northern hemisphere is more directly facing and tilted toward the sun. Therefore, and just naturally, more eclipses are going to occur in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. Six months later, after Earth has rotated uh, or revolved around the sun, it's the southern hemisphere that will be more directly tilted toward the sun, and there will be more eclipses in the southern hemisphere. And you should think, well, they should balance each other out for totals and annulars. Well, not quite. Why? Because in uh, our summer, in the June-July period, the sun, the, the Earth is furthest in its orbit, because Earth goes in an elliptical orbit as well, furthest in its orbit from the sun. The sun is slightly smaller in size, and so there is a greater chance that if there's an eclipse, the moon will be in that part of its orbit where it's big enough to cover the sun. And it's because the Earth is as far away as it is. That's why there are more total eclipses visible from the northern hemisphere proportionally than in the southern hemisphere. Because in the December-January period, Earth is closer to the sun, the sun appears larger, the moon is less frequently able to cover the entire surface of the sun. So that's why there is this difference. And this is, it can actually be shown quite well here. These are, this is information then for a period of about 600 years uh, from Jean Mayas. And, what, and I, I've reproduced it here. And what we can see is, if I can uh, do it here, there we go. What we see then is that uh, you get on average, on average, a total eclipse once every 375 years all over planet Earth. That's actually been updated in his more recent book to 381 and a half. So it's slightly less frequent. But an annual eclipse is visible, two annual eclipses are visible from any one location on Earth's surface about once every 224 years. Uh, so they are, they are more uh, frequent. What we see here then, however, and we see here on the left from minus 80 degrees latitude all the way up to the equator at zero degrees and then into the northern hemisphere, is that at 80 degrees north, we get a, uh, then one total eclipse from a particular position at the location of, uh, at 80 degrees north every 254 years, whereas at 80 degrees south, it's almost, it's about half as frequently once every 513 years and we get it then you know approximately equal uh, you know in the middle now 
when you're talking about annular eclipses, not surprisingly, and we'll go into the geometry, but annular uh, e e eclipses uh, are much more frequent near the poles. At the equator, you see, an on average, an annular eclipse recurring at any one location about every 279 years. And so there is a difference between um, northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, uh, and and of course we know what the you know what the the photos of these eclipses look like. I'm just going to show uh, three of uh, of Fred's. Uh, we see uh, a partial eclipse. Of course, must be taken through a solar filter, and you can see the color of the filter uh, here itself. This is from his website. An annular eclipse. And that's very much what it looks like through a telescope with a solar filter. And then one of his photographs of a total eclipse, the only time we can actually see the corona. All right, so moving on. Um, and this is one of mine, by the way. This was uh, back in 2013, a uh, very, very small partial uh, solar eclipse, only about three degrees above the horizon, uh, photographed um, from the uh, Hearn Generating Station on the lower the shore of uh, Lake Ontario here in Scarborough. Uh, another one, uh, partial solar eclipse, again at low altitude. I really just love photographing them uh, like this at low altitude, which was up in Muskoka in 2014. Um, this was my photograph of the annual eclipse uh, that I saw with Fred in, um, in 1994 in Ohio in May. Uh, and then you remember in June of 2021, there was an annular solar eclipse that was visible in North, uh, Ontario, Northern Ontario and then across the Arctic. I couldn't get there, but it was visible as a large partial eclipse here from Toronto. And so this was uh, on the shore of, uh, of Lake Ontario. And then back in 1991, total eclipse from uh, from uh, France, just north of, uh, of Paris. And so what we see here, Fred Espinac has done a really nice job in putting together maps for 20 years, showing uh, in these 20 year periods, all of the eclipse paths across planet Earth. And we see the blue ones, which are total eclipses, and the red ones that are annular eclipses. And interestingly here, you can see in this 20 year period, decidedly more total eclipses in the northern hemisphere and more annulars in the south, uh, which is exactly what I was talking about a little bit earlier. This one of July 10th, 1972, we'll be talking about just a little bit more, came across Canada. That was the very first one that I went to see. Uh, I've, I've been to see nine total eclipses and four annular eclipses. Um, and I was, I've been clouded out of only one total eclipse and it was my first one. And I knew at that time that I would have to wait seven long years to see another one. And that was this one, the February 1979 uh, eclipse that crossed, uh, that crossed here. Um, so that's one. I'm, uh, let me just go through these and we can see then from 81 to the year 2000, 20 year period, uh, we can see the 1994 annular eclipse that went across um, a large swath of the, uh, of the US. Uh, then we go forward uh, 2001 to 2020. Not an awful lot uh, of action in North America, except the great American eclipse of August 2017, which many people went to uh, in, into the path of totality to see. And of course, it was visible, I think, in clear skies as well here in Toronto. I was in Nebraska to observe that eclipse. Um, and then we uh, go on just to the last one. Well, actually, not the last one, I guess. Uh, yes, 2021 to 2014. And what we see here are two very large um, uh, annular eclipses, but that's because they're projected onto the inclined um, surface of Earth uh, in Canada, but in the northern regions. And then, of course, we get the great solar uh, eclipse, the total eclipse of April 2024, which now is uh, just uh, 14 months away, 14 and a little bit months away. So, Let's then take a look at these eclipses that cross North America. We're going to get very shortly to ones where the eclipse paths uh, cross, which is what this is, talk is really all about. And so between 1963 and 2024, which is next year, uh, what I'm going to show here are total eclipses in red and annular ones in yellow. Um, the annular ones in yellow only because you see some yellow sun on the you know, so uh, in the ring, and I just wanted to dem, you know, to sort of show it that way. So this is the July twentieth, nineteen sixty-three uh, solar uh, eclipse, which I saw as a kid at camp, with a um, as a partial solar eclipse with smoked glass that my father had given me back then to take to summer camp so that I could watch this. Uh, and of course, that's completely unsafe now, but who knew back then? So that was in July of um, 1963. Then in March 
of 1970. And this was just a couple of months before I joined the RASC. This was the first great American eclipse, probably the most uh, widely observed eclipse to that time. Uh, ever, because it received great publicity, and of course it, uh, it passed across um, the southern, southern U.S., southeastern U.S., south of Washington, and uh, a lot of people saw that one, and it received uh, a lot of press at that time. And as you can see, it also crossed um, Prince Edward Island, and we'll be talking about that a little bit more. Then the next one is the July 1972 eclipse, and that's the one I went to see it was clouded out of. Uh, I was actually on the north shore of the uh, south shore of the Gas Bay right here at a little town called Kapchat. What you can see here is that these two eclipses cross the pass of the 19, March 1970 and July 1972 eclipses crossed here. And so within a period of 17 months, lucky people who happened to be located within that little diamond shape, we'll talk about this a little bit more, were able to see two total eclipses in less than a year and a half. Then we get to the um, 1979 eclipse. This is the one we saw from Gidley, Manitoba, the first one I actually saw. We organized an expedition and chartered two aircraft to see that one. Uh, it was very successful. Then in 1984, there was a, a very short annular solar eclipse, which was very special uh, in its geometry. I won't get into that too much, but we went to Virginia to observe that eclipse. Um, the uh, great uh, long, long six and a bit minute uh, total solar eclipse across um, Mexico. Uh, again, we hired a jet aircraft to, uh, to fly to that one. A very famous eclipse a lot of people saw. Then um, in 1992, we actually went to Catalina Island to try to see this uh, annular eclipse that uh, ended uh, with the sun about one degree above the horizon and just a sunset, but we were clouded out of that one, unfortunately. Uh, and then 1994, there's one I had mentioned uh, earlier that I saw in Ohio, a, a quite a long uh, annular eclipse right across the middle of America. The 2017 eclipse that we uh, all know about and many of us uh, saw. Um, then a year and a half ago, the 2021 uh, June um, uh, annular eclipse in northern Canada. And then this coming October, another uh, fairly large and lengthy annular eclipse crosses the western U.S., and finally, in April, in April 2024, the great one that we've been looking for now, looking forward to since 2017. And what you'll see here is that the 2013 annual eclipse and the 2014 um, total eclipse cross here in Texas. And a lot of the towns there, little towns, are already have websites for that, and they're talking about being the eclipse capitals of the world, you know, etc. So I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, about these three. So. Um, central solar eclipses, if they can either intersect with two total eclipses uh, or a total and an annular one, it can also be two annular ones, but not uh, in the recent uh, era in North America. Probably the best known uh, from those of us who have been hanging around and those of us who are familiar a little bit with old 1970s music uh, are the total solar eclipses of 1970 and 72, both of which were visible from the same area in Nova Scotia. And so what we see here then is uh, the first one uh, uh, that I showed before, March of 1970 with that path uh, crossing up the eastern seaboard and then across Nova Scotia in the afternoon. And then the July 10th one that uh, also was in the afternoon uh, from the, uh, that can be seen crossing the same area of Nova Scotia. Looking closer then, we see Halifax and Truro, New Glasgow and Antigonish and Sydney, Cape Breton Island up in the upper right. And here we have the path then, the, uh, the path of totality of the March 7th, 1970 eclipse. And then just a year and a half uh, later, approximately, we see the other one, July of 1972 crossing. And within this area then, this, this diamond area, people located there in Antigonish and so on, and especially in, um, in uh, Gainsborough here, uh, near uh, the Cancel Causeway going out to Cape Breton, could see two total eclipses within this period of time. And here we see that this, um, that the, the area of this was approximately 100 kilometers in width here and approximately 50 kilometers here. So you multiply 100 by 50 and, uh, you know, what you're talking about then is, an, is some, you know, thousands of square kilometers of area in Nova Scotia 
where within a year and a half, two total eclipses could be seen. Interesting thing about them is that for the March one, these were both fairly short eclipses. Two minutes, 17 seconds for totality um, at this part of the uh, uh, of the eclipse. It was in the afternoon. The sun was fairly low, 28 degrees, not surprisingly, because A, it was in the afternoon, and B, it was in March, even before the spring equinox. In July, uh, 72 year and a half later, the duration was even shorter. It was only a two minute, five second eclipse as seen from this location. The sun was just a little bit higher in the sky, not surprisingly because it was Northern Hemisphere summer, but because it was so late, it was just before 6 p.m. in the afternoon, daylight time, uh, obviously, the sun was actually fairly low, uh, only 30 degrees. Um, and it was this eclipse, the July, that's, um, 20, uh, sorry, 1972 eclipse that, of course, Carly Simon sang about in her famous song, You're So Vain, uh, to see the total eclipse of the sun. It wasn't the 1970 eclipse, it was the 1972 eclipse. That song was released in November of that year, just after this event, a few months. So then we go on to more recent uh, events. And Paul, I am looking at the time. I think I got about eight more minutes. Um, so one in the one in the recent past and one in the uh, near future. And we have the eclipses of 2017 and 2024. And these are, again, both total eclipses. And just to remind us, um, this was the one that many of us saw uh, in August of 2017. And here I am at my observing site in Nebraska with my family. Um, got some photographs of uh, this one, which I was actually really, uh, really pleased with. We drove all night because where we were 500 kilometers to the east in Grand Island, Nebraska, it was cloudy. And we drove through the fog right to the, um, almost to the border of Wyoming, set up and managed to see it in the clearest sky I've ever had actually for a solar eclipse. And so that was my view of, uh, of totality there. Uh, and a somewhat uh, blown up view then of prominences on the edge of the eclipsed uh, sun. It was a great event. Okay, so going back, that was 2017. Are we going to see another one that is as good as that one in 2024? We can hope. And so here we have then the intersecting paths. Uh, and now it's seven years apart, not 17 months, but are almost seven uh, years apart, where people uh, in a number of states where they cross can see these, uh, can see both of these uh, eclipses without doing anything other than opening their front door and going outside and setting up their refractors, obviously. And so here's the area we see uh, then uh, the states that are involved. We see the cities of uh, St. Louis, Louisville, Kentucky, Cincinnati, uh, Nashville, and you know uh, various, various others. Uh, the Mississippi River here, and these pink lines indicate uh, state, uh, state borders. And so the first one from 2017, we see cross right through St. Louis. So people in northern St. Louis didn't see a total eclipse. People in southern St. Louis did see the total eclipse and the great gateway art um, just on the west side of the Mississippi in downtown St. Louis just barely saw totality. So it was a happy art. Then we have the 2024 one, which is a longer eclipse with a wider path of totality, as you can see here, and it crosses in this area. And so uh, there are four states here in which people can uh, will, will be able to have seen uh, two total eclipses within seven years. And my understanding is that it was actually reasonably clear in this area for August, on August 21, 2017. Who knows what it'll be like in April. April is much more challenging for weather for, um, uh, for North America, for sure. And here what we see is that this, um, the dimensions here, 126 uh, kilometers and then 208 kilometers uh, in, 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 in um, sort of length. And so it was a, it's a much larger area within which people could see both of these eclipses than it was in 70 and 72. And we also see that the durations um, are, uh, you know, have some real difference. First of all, in 2017, it still was an under three minute eclipse. It was more than either of the ones in 70 or 70. It was uh, two, uh, um, two minutes, 40 seconds totality at this location, but the sun's altitude was way higher. And not surprisingly, it was just in the uh, just in the afternoon, as you can see at 1321 uh, central time, daylight time. So the sun was very high. In 2024, one of the reasons this is being called the great or really great American eclipse is that the duration of the um, total phase of the eclipse along almost all of its path exceeds four minutes. That's a long, uh, a long eclipse. 
the longest that is uh, possible mathematically in this epoch is seven minutes, 30 seconds. Um, that uh, we don't see that in our lifetimes, that's for sure. Uh, and the sun will be up very, uh, you know, quite high, 56, 57 degrees at this location. So that's going to be a, a really interesting uh, eclipse to see. Um, and then finally, to those two, we're going to add the annular eclipse that I just talked about that will be visible across the U.S. Uh, this coming October. And so to remind you, that's the path of this annular eclipse. Uh, and so it will cross the U.S. and Mexico. Uh, the closest distance, and I can tell you because I'm already planning to be there if I can, driving distance from Toronto to the center line of this eclipse is 2,800 kilometers. And my plan right now, if I can get the time and get away from various court hearings, is to go to observe just a few kilometers outside Roswell, New Mexico. Gee, no one's ever heard of that place before. That's where the center line passes uh, just 30 kilometers outside uh, downtown Roswell. So we put the other uh, two eclipses that we were talking about on the screen here and what we can see is that the 2017 eclipse and the 2023 eclipse crossed here over the uh, over the ocean the Pacific Ocean and uh, not unobservable but probably no one will have seen that but here in Texas these two paths uh, will cross and uh, already the towns located there have websites they're talking about themselves in addition to being cowboy capital of the world one of them is within this uh, little diamond shape um, they're also eclipse capitals of the world who knew and so here we have um, texas and uh, and um, and northern mexico um, and here we're seeing already the advertising that is taking uh, taking place uh, on various websites. This then is the path of the annular eclipse this coming uh, October. And uh, we can see that it's actually fairly wide. It passes right over Corpus Christi, which is right on the coast. I have a backup observing site there. Uh, and uh, and then this, this then will be the April 2024 eclipse. And so we see here that there's a nice diamond shaped area within which both of these are going to be able to be seen uh, under the great uh, skies of Texas. Well, Texas is going to have its cloud problems as well. It's too bad that the best weather is actually going to be in Mexico. Be interesting to see how many Americans want to, uh, want to try to cross into Mexico on eclipse morning to see that eclipse. And so what we see here then is 187 kilometer width here, 211 kilometers here. And you can do the math and figure out that this is a fairly large area. Uh, it's interesting that uh, for the total eclipse, again, the southern limit passes almost directly right through downtown San Antonio. And so you uh, people in San Antonio will want to live, real estate prices will probably go up, in northwestern San Antonio, so they'll see the total eclipse. In southeastern San Antonio, they'll see a very large partial eclipse, but no corona. And here we see that these eclipses both exceed four minutes in length. The annular one, four minutes, 50 seconds, which is a long one with the uh, sun conveniently about 46 degrees up in the sky. Uh, and then in the April one, it's early in the eclipse path. And so it's just a little bit um, uh, afternoon. The sun uh, is even higher, it's 67 degrees. And that duration here at this location is four minutes and 26 seconds. So a lot of people are talking about going to Texas. I've been thinking about that myself actually for many years uh, sort of trying to figure out exactly where we're going to uh, be uh, observing and so I'm going to stop there this is just a little composition of three of my photos from the 2017 uh, eclipse and I am simply going to say uh, thank you hope you've enjoyed this and it'll prompt some thinking um, you know about the geometry of eclipses and so on and Paul I don't know where there's any time there may not be any questions from me either anyway I've uh, enjoyed uh, presenting this to you and I hope you've liked it. Thank you, Michael. Excellent presentation. Uh, lots of interesting detail. Uh, and uh, quite timely. Even though these eclipses are months away, it does take time to prepare uh, and travel plans. So uh, thank you for reminding us of, of these eclipses. Uh, let's see if there are any questions online. Emma. <laughs> Hi, yes, we got a question from online coming in from Ron McNaughton. Um, Michael, I've seen two eclipses, 1999-2017, from close to the center line. Are there things which can be better seen while closer to the edge? 
Well, uh, first of all, hi, Ron. It's nice to, uh, Ron, I've known each other for decades, I think. Um, and yes, that's a very good question. And and the answer uh, is yes. Most people gravitate to the center line, and I do myself, because that's where the uh, duration of totality is actually maximized. When you get toward the edge, you can imagine that the moon is being displaced a little bit, you know, further and further away from the center. And when you get to the edge and then just outside the edge, it's not a total eclipse at all. And so just at the edge or just slightly inside, the total phase of the eclipse is very short. It can be only a second or a very few seconds. But what you do get, and you can often see, is so-called Bailey's bees. I'm not going to go into all of those, but those are essentially, those are rays of sun breaking through the valleys on the limb or the edge of the, of the moon. Uh, and you can see those Bailey's beads for a much longer period of time. If you're on the center line, you can see them for just, and I know this because I've watched them several times, just for a very few seconds before totality starts. And then when the moon moves off on the other side, you can see them for just a very few seconds. If you're near the edge of the path, you give up a lot of totality, but you can see those Bailey's beads for up to 20 or even 30 seconds if you're located at the right uh, location. So that's one of the, the, the main things um, that I think is the probably the greatest di uh, difference, Ron. Well, that's really cool. Thank you so much. Uh, that was, that's the only question we got online. All right. So Any more questions uh, in the room? No questions. Uh, Michael, I have a question myself. Uh, in the beginning of the presentation, you, you, you described a fourth type of eclipse. Yes. I've never heard of that before, ever. Okay, what I'm going to do, let me, if I, if I may, and I think I uh, can do this probably uh, fairly, uh, fairly quickly. Do, do, do. Sorry, maybe I can't. <laughs> um, all right. So it, 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 it's a hybrid. Uh, it, it's a so-called hybrid eclipse. And so let us think of it this way. If we think about um, the, and, and let's say the sun is up there, and we have the curved surface of Earth, and the Moon's shadow then is going to is going to cross Earth from you know hitting the western side of planet Earth, then crossing the planet, and then off to the east and into space. When it hits um, the the um, western side, the shadow hits the western side. It's at a part. It'll hit Earth that is further away than when it then crosses to. We are where the sun's directly overhead. This part of planet Earth is going to be closer to the sun than this part where the shadow first hits. And so if the moon is at just that point of its orbit, where it just barely covers the sun, as seen when the sun's directly overhead, when the moon's shadow hits here, the moon is a little further away and it won't quite cover the sun. So that'll be the, it'll be annular, a tiny, tiny razor thin ring of sunlight. Then as the shadow races across for those further east, the moon will start to appear bigger in the sky and at some point it will cover the sun completely and there will be a region here in the path that will be that will experience a total eclipse, but very short, only a very few seconds at most. And then the same thing happens as the shadow moves uh, across to the eastern the eastern side of the planet, and and um, it gets further away. The moon gets further away, and it reveals again a razor thin ring around the outside. Those are so called hybrid eclipses, and you can imagine just from my description that they don't happen very often anywhere. All right, uh, so I think there are no more questions here. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for uh, presenting to us once again, and uh, we look forward to a future presentation uh, from you. Uh, let's move on to our next uh, speaker, and that is Frank Dempsey, uh, who's uh, here with us uh, this evening, and will uh, talk to us about uh, uh, further developments of an Alcazimuth mount uh, that uh, he's been working on for some time. And uh, we'll give him a moment to uh, get set up. Yes, we're set to go. So I guess uh, the idea is to getting, avoid getting too close to the mic to cause feedback and we'll see what we can do here. So I guess right there also do it. Okay. 
Well, I've just got a uh, close to the events, uh, Friday events button here. So, um, title says it all. So, um, it's possible that some of you may remember this, the talks I did the past several years, and I tried to do it by internet, by Zoom, and quite a nuisance with little internet, kept uh, losing signal and so on. So, but no more of that, but had the opportunity to do it here live. So, um, I asked Paul if it would be, uh, might be in, in the interest to do an update on it. So, it is, uh, this is the update. So, um, a little bit of further development I've done in the past few months, um, especially as summer is, is moved into winter. Um, I think that picture is a throw a picture, a throw an image of it all. And for you in the room, that's sitting on the table there, in case any of you want to have a look at it later. So I thought I'd do um, a few seconds of background in case you didn't catch the earlier um, talks I did about it. But why did I do this? And so the original idea was to um, see if um, I could uh, uh, build this uh, merry-go-round observatory that was built first by Leslie Peltier, who was a fairly famous comet, hunt comet hunter and variable star observer about half a century ago when visual observing was uh, fairly common. And so this appeared on a forum on one of the astronomy uh, sites, uh, just a question, has anybody built one? So I thought, hey, neat idea, that's a fun project to do. So I started to do that. So I looked into it a little bit more and here's a few details about it. I'll just point out a few details of relevance. The hut or shack rotates on, um, on a track of steel on the ground. And that's why it's called a merry-go-round because it was probably Probably, you know, half a century ago, a child's merry-go-round was maybe a common thing in, say, a Sears catalog, maybe, and I don't know, so maybe, you know, scrap steel was around, and um, he, he got a hold of one and built an observatory on it. So he called it the merry-go-round observatory. Um, the other few details here are it's an enclosed hut where he has a little table and desk where he can put his charts and log books and so on, and it's an altazimuth mount, so his telescope is um, pointing out through a sod in the roof. Otherwise, he's sitting comfortably inside his little hut where it can rotate and uh, the uh, telescope uh, moving in, uh, in an altitude and the hut moving in azimuth makes it an altazimuth mount. So a few little details there and that's why I, I set off on a um, path of more or less copying that. So here's my version uh, without the hut. So I started to do this. I got a rotating platform on caster wheels, which you can't see here, but um, the main details are the um, um, mount, so you can barely see the mount uh, in that A-frame, which would be one of the walls of the finished hut when it were finished. Um, little telescope is there is a, is a four-inch reflector that I made a few years ago, but the main point there is it's an old, fairly old-fashioned uh, altazimuth. I actually think it's an equatorial mount that I converted to an uh, altazimuth mount. The point is it's um, a mount that you might have saw, seen on um, a commercially made telescope uh, decades ago. Maybe it's still available, I don't know, but I got a hold of one, so that was my first guess use that to make some altazimuth motions. I thought it was a little wobbly and as they were known to be, uh, you may actually have one of these mounts and um, fine, uh, it's good for scrap metal, but it's good for a fairly light, light duty telescope as well. Otherwise, the main point here is um, the, the platform rotates on the ground and there's some movement for the telescope to move on. Um, so um, I thought a better idea is a, a Dob, sort, Dob style base. And so that's what I've pictured here. So you see a cradle, um, with, uh, it's actually a three-point daub where um, a cradle would sit into that, uh, into the uh, base and it would rotate. Uh, same thing on the side of the hut on the A-frame. So I thought, um, fine, that seems to work. And um, this is the version I ended up with. So here's where I finished off with the last presentation I did, maybe last summer. So big pair of binoculars, that's what I wanted to, to mount uh, or to put to use. Um, it's sitting on this, um, um, daub base sort of mount, which sits on top of um, any old uh, tripod. And you see in the lower right, it's fine for sitting position where I don't have to be too high. These particular binoculars have a 45 degree um, eyepiece and interchangeable eyepieces. So it's not a fixed magnification. Um, so that's where it was um, last summer. And so um, I started off mounting a telescope and I thought to mount these heavy uh, 100 millimeter binoculars would be far more far more uh, useful. So I've built it to fit those binoculars. So that's where I finished off. And so I did a little bit further development uh, after that. And so um, I thought, first of all, I should point out what it doesn't do. So we understand what we're talking about here. So it's not a super high magnification planetary telescope like you might see on the left there. It's not a really fancy automatic image, imaging rig like you see in um, modern day um, e-scope Equinox. It costs many thousands of dollars. Um, operates at the press of a button. It's not one of them. It's not a super heavy duty aperture, uh, 12 and a half inch uh, reflector like you see in the lower left. And it's not a, 
photoelectric photometry and spectroscopy rig. Um, you've seen the lower right with um, gadgets and wires all over the place. It's not to do all that. It's not that at all. It's for visual observing only. And so um, here's the first modification I made. Um, I attached um, a good finder scope onto the, um, the base. So I actually have different telescopes that can mount onto it. The telescope you see here on the table is not the binoculars, of course, um, but it's one of several different telescopes I've put onto that base. And so the first thing it needed was a good finder that sits on the base so that the telescope that fits into it doesn't actually need um, doesn't actually um, need a finder for itself. But um, a right angle correct image finder scope I decided uh, several years ago is the ideal proper finder scope to have on a telescope. And so um, they don't normally come with telescopes because they cost several hundred dollars. And a, a telescope that comes with uh, most uh, telescopes finder scope that comes with it is normally not a right angle, right angle correct image finder scope. It's, a, it's an inverted image. And so in my, in my opinion, for visual observing using charts, it's, it's very difficult to use. It's useless. It's worth the extra expense to find um, a right angle correct image um, scope for a finder scope. So I decided that a few years ago. I've got numerous telescopes, so I started hoarding these whenever I saw them on sale. So I've got um, a few of them, but I, I decided on this particular little base only need one. So that was one uh, modification I made. Um, so um, the, you, you, I didn't point it out here, but the, um, the base rotates on two uh, thick sheets of plastic that I found, and I made the whole thing out of scrap. So it's a lot of scrap, and um, if you ask me where to buy it, I say you don't need to because there's so much plastic garbage and waste all over the place. You don't need to look very hard to find uh, two sheets of plastic that will rotate one on the other with, without much friction. But um, that's the way it was, as you see in the um, left-hand image. Um, the, it was uh, one of those sheets of plastic. The other is on the, the base sitting on top of the tripod. Um, so that was fine in the summertime, but in wintertime, um, it started to get cold and it had a little bit of bit more friction than I wanted it to have. So I thought, is there anything I can, I can put on to reduce the friction? And yes, so I, I found, you know, I had some CDs, old CDs. I was ready to throw out a box and I thought, Hmm, these slide over each other pretty nicely. So I wonder if I can make them put, uh, put them to use. And yes, I dropped them onto the basin between the two sheets of plastic. They're fairly easy to cut in half with uh, good tin snips. And so here in the image, you can see um, I've, I've, I've attached them with silicone sealant onto the, um, the basin. The top plate slides over it really well. So it's quite frictionless in the cold weather that we have. So um, if, it, if it persists into the summer, I think that'll be the permanent solution. So um, that was one thing. It also reduces what I call stiction, where stiction is um, where it sticks together. When you want to move it um, in, a, in some dob scope, for instance, um, you want them to move and they move freely. But if you actually get them to start moving, there's a little bit of um, sticking motion. So uh, it's a bit of a nuisance when you want to move your scope just a tiny little bit and you have to bump it past that stiction point. So I find that the CDs reduce stiction to quite a tiny amount. So. This is pretty uh, a pretty good um, solution, in my opinion. Looks like a mess, but it works really well. Um, another new band controller uh, added on. Um, you don't need to ask, uh, or it could be a quiz. Um, didn't know I was going to test it, did you? But if you don't, if you have a telescope or a binocular with um, um, a lens or a glass element on the front, um, how long will it last before it gets viewed up? Any guesses? It doesn't matter because it's not very long. So you have to do something about it. You have to, uh, you can't really operate for very long, you know, more than half an hour in most cases, unless you have a night where you have um, a cool, dry northeast wind blowing. Um, most of the time they'll have dew within an hour in most cases. And so um, to have a dew controller fastened onto it, not dangling off the side, not hanging around with wires that get, um, you get uh, tripped over and so on, but um, just actually build it onto the base and it's, sitting on there now, it's just tucked out of the way and there is room for it on the base underneath the telescope. So it fits really well. So that was one, another important solution to actually build it in. And so I'll drag the whole thing out, um, just plop it down and it's ready to go. I'm ready to plug in if I need to plug it in. So those are a few little uh, developments that I made on it. And that was um, most of what I wanted to illustrate. Um, so it's current use, the main intended use uh, after I decided that um, these binoculars would be more useful mounting on this rather than a telescope as in the original intention with um, the merry-go-round observatory. Um, fairly big binoculars. I didn't bring them here because it's they're fairly heavy. <coughs> fairly heavy. Um, sometimes people um, mount big binoculars on top of a tripod. Um, I think I had a slide in here somewhere of that. 
Um, the point here is um, binoculars fit into that base. base I, I made the base to hold the binoculars to be wide enough to hold those binoculars. Does a really good job. Um, there's no vibration, um, no shaking, um, but uh, the tripod solution did wasn't really uh, okay for this uh, size of binoculars. And I used to have um, Celestron 25 by 100 millimeter binoculars as well, which are nearly as heavy. I don't know if anybody here has them, but they're more common really. But I found these ones, uh, an old um, um, Garrett uh, model of binocular. As I mentioned, they have 45 degree eyepieces and removable interchangeable eyepieces. So they're quite, um, quite an upgrade in my opinion. But the base holds those binoculars really well. So I really built the base around those binoculars. And most, the, the few telescopes I put in are smaller, so I'll try to illustrate them. Um, this is one, uh, which one is this? Uh, this? This is the 80 millimeter telescope that you see right on the table here. So it fits in pretty well. Um, I, I may not have pointed out that they um, mount with um, a Vixen dovetail. So a Vixen dovetail bar is mounted on the bottom of the binoculars and the telescope that I have here. And a Vixen dovetail base is sitting in the, in the base there. If you really want to look at it closely, I can show you, but it's, it's really easy to interchange the telescope or binoculars on this mount. Uh, this is a 100 millimeter uh, Maxitov, a very ancient Mead uh, telescope. Um, does a really nice job of um, giving really sharp images, really wide field of view, uh, it's low, low magnification. Um, and so once again, with this and the other telescopes I'm illustrating, the mount moves really well. Um, it keeps the uh, stars in, in the field of view, it can bump it along just slowly. And uh, as, I mentioned, as I mentioned, friction is reduced small enough that I can move it really quite smoothly just by hand. When I wanted. So um, that's the um, 100 millimeter um, Mead. Um, this is a 114 millimeter longer telescope. Um, has a piece of glass on the front, which needs view protection as well, as I mentioned. Um, but again, it's small enough to fit inside the cradle. And you may see here its dovetail plate is a bit more visible just because of the way I have the photograph taken there. So um, I think that's that. Uh, this, I, I, I tested it by putting on this. Um, Six inch, or actually 152 millimeter Maxitov. I think it's a MacCast telescope. Any of you that has gone to the um, Pickering uh, Lake Lakeshore uh, public outreach events may have seen this. I had it in the past uh, events, past couple of events that we did in autumn of, of last year. Um, it's a phenomenal planetary telescope. It's capable of magnifications of around three to 400 power. Um, but I didn't do that. I thought it's a little heavy and a little overwhelming this little amount, but it's not. I'm amazed that it does quite a good job holding it that heavy of a telescope. It may actually be heavier than those heavy binoculars that I showed. Anyway, uh, just one of its um, the scopes that I find I could use with this mount. Although I, I think the smaller scopes I showed you earlier are more are more likely to be used on a um, portable basis. Um, so um, I'm. Uh, one, one little detail is how I'm using it. And so the point here is with star charts. So the illustration shows some star charts that I use. So you may or may not be familiar with the star Sky Atlas 2000. Um, that's what I have there. And Uranometria um, is also um, a fairly uh, well-known in past years atlas because a lot of people don't use atlases or star charts anymore. Um, I do. And so that one there, I put into three ring binders so I can take the sheets out. But I use them all the time. And so that's how I'm that's observing that I do. So definitely don't need a keypad. Keypad is no use here. It's totally movable by, movable by hand and um, totally re required to recognize the stars and constellations and navigate that way to the target. So that's how this telescope works. And that's why I pointed out it's not for um, other uh, super imaging or, or photometry or planetary things that require really high magnification. These are um, generally low power wide field telescopes that um, allow me to easily find my target. So what are my targets? I think I put in a picture here somewhere. Um, yeah, here, here are my targets. So you may uh, recognize the um, pages. They may be a little blurry from RESC handbook. Um, one page is for dark nebulae. And dark, dark nebulas are uh, one thing that I'll do from really dark sky locations with a really wide field of view. And that's where those big binoculars will come in uh, pretty useful. Um, but any of these little small wide field telescopes will also do a good job, I think. Um, lower left shows a, a page from double and multiple stars. And I do, I've just start, started doing quite a lot of double star observing and these small telescopes do a really good job of it, even without tracking and requiring manual uh, navigation to the, to the target. Um, 
carbon stars. So the Astronomical League has an interesting program for, for carbon stars. And so I've observed them. So one of my log sheets is up there on the right. There's also a page or, or a good list in the Observer's Handbook for carbon stars, mostly similar stars to what are on the Astronomical League's uh, list of carbon stars. Anyway, uh, variable stars is the other thing that I do quite a lot of. And um, it's also fun to find those stars manually by, by charts and um, by star hopping. So those are what I plan to use it for. I think that's the uh, end of the presentation. So any questions or comments? Um, you might find your answer if you have a look at this uh, set up on the table. Otherwise, any questions, I'll be glad to answer any questions. So that's it. For uh, sharing uh, your amount uh, with us. Uh, and uh, we'll certainly have a look at it after the meeting. Um, let's go to any questions. Uh, um, can you guys hear me? Yes, okay. Uh, no, we didn't get any questions from you too. Okay. And in the room, we have Ed here with a question. Come on up. Hi, Frank. I'm um, just noticing that you had various, like, like diameters of telescopes in there. And obviously it pivots on that pivot for the altitude, but do the different diameters kind of affect where the balance is and it might want to flop upwards or flop downwards? Yes, that's a good question about the balance. The short answer to your question is no, it doesn't seem to affect it because the um, uh, dovetail bars um, uh, fitting in a dovetail base have, um, a few inches or a good few centimeters or more of, of travel. So um, they're really easy to balance. So I've been shocked by how well they balance because I originally intended to put in uh, a bar with a counterweight to assist in balancing it. But um, I've been surprised at how easy I can find balance on these scopes, even when I change eyepieces from lighter to heavier or, or whatever. But the um, dovetail arrangement allows me to, um, allow, allows a, you know several inches or a good five centimeters of up and down motion that allows me to easily find balance. And so I've been shocked about how well balanced um, each of those little scopes is. So it hasn't been a problem with either the lighter scopes or the heavier scopes and binoculars. Um, as well as balance, um, a further note is the uh, stability of the whole thing. The whole thing is vastly more stable than the small um, mount, um, old equatorial mount that might have showed uh, earlier in the, back, in, in the earlier version. Um, I think it's because of um, fairly wide, um, wide base um, b between the pivots. Um, and it's also fairly low, pretty low to the tripod. And it's just, you know, three quarter plywood, so that's fairly sturdy too. So um, as well as balance, its stability is amazing. So I'm really thoroughly impressed at uh, what a nice job it did. Okay, thank you. We have one more question coming up. That's, uh, that's a really cool hack. Thank you, the, the way you, you built that. I uh, just curious about the finder scope. I, do, do you, when you're switching out telescopes, uh, I guess if you're doing wide, wide field, aligning the finder scope, probably not critical, but if it were critical, how, how tough a job is aligning the, the main scope and the finder scope? Um, it's easy. Um, it's easier to illustrate. With the one I brought on the table, I didn't actually bring pack the little bracket which detaches. So here's a good picture right here. Um, so the point here is, um, in case I didn't make it clear, that bracket with the finder scope stays with the mount. So it stays there, and once I've got it aligned, um, it's only held on by two bolts, but, but it, once I've got it aligned, it stays aligned to all the telescopes, or it's close enough to all the telescopes. So I start off with a, uh, it's also worthwhile to mention each of these telescopes um, at low power, has a very wide field of view, a good three degrees approximately, generally speaking, a good three degrees of field of view, so that it's really easy to line up the finder scope in my light blue to sky, on um, any star and, um, and then use the telescope itself as a finder for the rest of my star hopping because it's such a wide field of view. So, but to answer your question, um, once I've got it set up and aligned, it's aligned for all the telescopes because they all line up in the same dovetail base. So dovetail um, base, the dovetail bar in the dovetail base causes it to be lined up all the time. Uh, every telescope and every binoculars lines up perfectly. So. Uh, once the finder is set up, it's um, it's done. Frank, I have a question myself. Um, what material did you use for the altitude bearing? 
Um, it's um, uh, it's um, it's a word PVC. Um, where basically the short answer is pl plastic plumbing pipe. And so the um, it's approximately uh, you see the one on the left in this picture. It's approximately three inch diameter, or very roughly plumbing pipe. And then I use a slightly larger pipe for the other uh, for the for the um, bases in which it rests. And so you can see a better picture right here at the very, very extreme lower left. There's two little pads um, made from a slightly larger diameter pipe. And that just meant cutting a piece of pipe, you know, cut about two centimeters long, um, and cutting off a tiny section of it. Just because its radius of curvature is slightly larger than that pipe. You see that pipe, it's, uh, there it's maybe um, one inch or a couple of centimeters wide. And just I just cut a plywood disc to fit inside it. And so um, short answer, plastic pipe. Uh, any more questions in the room? Okay, good. Thank you very much again. Okay, so that concludes our speakers for this evening. Uh, I'll call on our president, Tom Luton, to take care of the announcements. And here comes Tom. So, um, first of all, I've got the unfortunate task. I'm the bearer of some bad news tonight. Um, Francois mentioned this earlier, and I've only found out about this within the last two hours. Um, tonight, we have lost, or today, we have lost a major Canadian icon of amateur astronomy. Uh, I regret to announce that Terry Dickinson has passed away at the age of 79. Um, for many of us, Terry's books um, were the really the introductory documents we were using to become amateur astronomers. When I was, geez, when I was nine years old and first getting into this hobby, um, the librarian at the Toronto Public Library handed me this book, this big, thick, spiral-bound book called Night Watch. Um, I got my own copy for uh, Christmas a year later, and I read that thing to pieces. I was fortunate enough years later to get that battered copy signed by Terry. I had the great opportunity to meet him on a couple of occasions to actually observe at his facility in Yarker, Ontario. Um, uh, Terry's uh, list of achievements is fairly extensive. Um, former editor of Astronomy Magazine. Uh, he was also uh, the founder of Sky News, the publication which is now uh, distributed with the RASC uh, membership. Um, he was a, um, sorry, the exact, I want to get this right. Uh, he was even uh, awarded, uh, he was a member of the Order of Canada. Uh, He's got even an asteroid named after him. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, could I ask you to stand for a brief moment of silence in Terry's memory? Ward, where'd you hide the slides?
Please put, put it on the screen. No, you're not the full screen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. glitch and it's happened but anyway okay so um, first of all thank you very much for coming out tonight um, our first meeting in three years um, when we started planning for this we were wondering how many folks were going to show uh, I'm delighted to say that not only have we filled all the chairs that we'd originally set out we even filled all the chairs that we had decided to add at the last minute Thank you very much. And for those of you who are online, we're hoping that you'll come join us as well in person uh, sometime in the next few months. So, um, um, okay, so we have uh, two types of meetings here uh, online and now uh, in person. Uh, we have our recreational astronomy nights, um, which will be held going from this point on uh, in person here at the Ontario Science Center and also online at the same time. And as you've seen, we'll have the sky this month. We'll have a couple of members of the uh, Toronto Center or from our other areas speaking about uh, their current projects and uh, where they've gone for uh, observing trips. And we also have our speaker nights. These will continue to be online uh, for the time being. And this is where a member of the uh, professional astronomical community will come in and talk about their projects and where they've been observing. So uh, if you're watching us live right now on YouTube, um, uh, please say hello in the chat. Um, if you've got some questions for the presenters, please ask like uh, so many others have done before. Uh, if you're a new member, and uh, uh, please introduce yourself. And if you're coming to us from far, far away, please let us know where you're coming from. Oh, and on that note, from the audience, can I get a show of hands? Is there anyone here for the first time who's never attended Welcome. <laughs> Wonderful. So our next speakers night meeting is going to be in two weeks online, uh, the 15th of February at 7.30 p.m. Uh, Alex Inanen, will, who is a PhD candidate at York University, will be discussing 10 years in counting of the Curiosity rover on Mars. Online at the youtube.com slash Rask Toronto slash live. Our next recreational astronomy night meeting will be right here in one month. Uh, uh, Claudio Oriani will be discussing the sky this month, and uh, we have, as of last uh, most recent update, we have two open slots. Two open slots, no, Paul. Two open slots available to present. So if you've got something you'd like to tell us all about, let us know. Let Paul know. So coming up at the DDO um, in the next little while, on Saturday, February the 4th at 7 p.m. Uh, is Astronomy Speakers Night. Uh, Dr. Oh, I apologize. I'm going to get this wrong. Dr. Yizun Guan will be discussing mapping our universe in millimeter. What have we learned? Uh, registration links can be found on the rasto.ca website. On Sunday, February 5th at 2.30 p.m. Um, is DDO Planetarium Day. And if the first showing is sold out, there will be another showing taking place immediately before the main showing at 1 p.m. Again, registration details are at rasto.ca. Uh, 
on February the 20 on February 25th at 7:30 p.m. is DDO up in the sky. And on February 26th, is Sunday sun gazing. Um, for all of these events, you can register online at rasto.ca. Okay, um, the Car Astronomical Observatory is open, however, the road is not. Um, our club observatory up in the Blue Mountains, um, road conditions are, well, the road's not plowed for the last kilometer. So snowshoes are kind of a necessity. But if you have the gear to get in, uh, you can access the CAO. Um, total site occupancy is uh, limited to 25 people. Upstairs washroom, we've still got a bunch of COVID regulations in place. Um, we're taking things cautiously on this. So upstairs washrooms only for upstairs bookings. Maximum occupancy is limited um, to two members of the same family per bedroom with a total of six people. As communal area is limited to three people, mask wearing is, man is required. All CIO users can use both kitchens, the downstairs washroom, and masks. Full details are on the website. Please read everything before you make your bookings. Um, the Toronto Centre runs on volunteer energy. Uh, we've got a few spots that we're still looking for some bodies to fill. Um, we're looking for an education and public outreach chair and a light pollution committee chair. Uh, as well as a volunteer committee chair and a marketing committee chair. Um, the AV committee, the folks who work so hard to get this entire show done are always looking for additional help. Um, you know, these guys work really, really, really hard and they could use a break. Um, and we can always use more folks to help out with the education uh, public outreach committee. Um, anyone who also has a telescope camera op who can be a telescope camera operator for virtual star parties. Oh, and a reminder to those folks uh, online in here that in order to volunteer, you must first be a member. Okay, uh, this is the point where I get to plug uh, RASC membership in general. Um, comes with a whole bunch of cool features like the Observer's Handbook, uh, Observer's Calendar, um, and uh, also there's a uh, subscription to Sky News. Uh, full details are available at RAS, or, <clears throat> sorry, full details are available at uh, uh, the national website uh, rask.ca. Gift memberships are also available. Contact uh, the National Office at Mempub at rask.ca for full details. Now this is the one part where I really wish I had this up on the screen because it's a map. Because now this is something I've wanted to do for the two years that I've already been president and that is to invite you to the meeting after the meeting. Now, I'm serious about this. A presidential term is only two years. If I hadn't uh, agreed to stay for a second term, I would have missed the chance to actually do this. Period. That's how long we've been uh, away from the Science Center. So um, uh, we meet at the Granite Brew Pub on the southeast corner of Eglinton and Mount Pleasant, 245 Eglinton Avenue East. If you want to plug that into um, whichever uh, device you care to use to navigate, um, free underground parking. Actually, I hope so. There's a lot of stuff has changed in the world. But that's one thing I just realized I forgot to double check. Assume free underground parking, blame me if it's not. Um, we do have a reservation. Um, they are using winter hours at the moment, um, which means they've asked, their, they've agreed to keep the kitchen open a little later than normal, but they've asked us to please um, sort of get over there as soon as possible. So if you're going to join us at the Granite, um, normally there's a lot of people chatting around. Um, save all your chat for uh, over a pint. And for everyone else online, um, and to everyone here, have a good night. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, the, if you've liked what you've seen here on YouTube, 
um, please like and subscribe. Hit the notification bell. You can also follow us on um, social media such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, and uh, be safe and keep looking up. And good night, everybody.